Hello everyone, I hope you are doing well. By the time this video gets published, it will be Boxing Day already. So I hope you all had a Merry Christmas and wish you all a Happy Boxing Day. Hope the holiday season and the new year brings good luck and better times to all of us, especially after such a terrible year. This is my second monthly Q&A video. Do check out last month's Q&A video if you haven't already. Link is in the description. So let's get started. The first question is from uh, Frederic Gaudin, a former student of mine in Montreal. He actually asked two questions on one of my videos. I'd like to answer the first question today since the second one is related to weapons training and will be covered in another series in the, in the future. So, Frederick's question is, what feature distinguishes a style focusing on long versus short range and what are features which make Xing Yi correspond, correspond to the former? I guess no style focuses 100% exclusively on short, neither long range, but it's rather a spectrum with emphasis sometimes put on the long, short range. So, thank you, Frederic. This is an excellent question since this question covers the differences between two main fighting approaches in Chinese martial styles. Of course, there is no absolute long range and short range differences in a self defense situation since every martial artist trains their reflex, speed, power, and uh, any necessary skills through their practice. However, during formal practice, there are differences. For example, their movements, especially the way the arms extend, is different. A short run style like Xing Yi does not have a lot of movements that fully extend the arms, but instead, the arm will maintain a naturally bent posture most of the time. Regarding the stepping method, a short range style like Xing Yi tends to step forward and backward, closely responding to their arm movement. Arm and leg should move together. Also, for short range styles, shoulders, elbows, knees, and hips are commonly used in self defense situations, which requires a close range fighting strategy. And you can notice that in some practice, people emphasize on the opening and the closing motion of the chest and the other part of the body which is the very obvious characteristics of these close range styles. Next question is an interesting one from Jeremy Kasovic. Sorry if I'm butchering your last name. He posted this on my Xing Yi 5 Elements video. Are you striking with the knuckles of the fingers? Do you toughen the, this? Okay, ideally, any style of a martial art would strike with any part of the body. When I was a kid, I practiced some physical strengthening to toughen some area of the body, such as the palm, the arm, and so on. It is necessary in practice for self-defense purposes. However, you should be careful for of potential injury especially you are in your 30s or older. Your body's natural healing speed will change with age. Yes, hard training is great, but if you do not want to become a professional fighter, then there's no point in risking injury. Instead, you should focus on being healthy and work on being able to defend yourself in real-life situations. Actually, oftentimes, damage caused by risky and excessive training can be more harmful than that caused by your opponents during fighting. So, my opinion is that if you are in your 30s or older, 
you should focus on cultivating skills and power and not on the toughness of certain areas of your body. Or oh, you would regret it in the long run, especially in your senior years. Next question is from Mr. Chin Huin Tan. He has asked about the intensity of training. His comments is one training internal styles, routines, how many repetitions and how much intensity should we incorporate? Some experiences of mine and also from my friends were being told to go all out and repeat as much as we can in between 3 to 5 minutes rest. It feels good when training in younger days, but as we age, how should we maintain yet still improving? I often trained till I sweat the whole floor, but I read that it is not a good practice and it might bring harm if doing it long term. Would like to see your advice. Thank you. Okay, this is the great question. Before answering this question, let me share some information about how I practiced when I was a child. Officially, I started practicing martial art at age 7. I'm intentionally using the word officially since from the day I started, I did not miss a day for many years unless I was sick so that I could take a couple of days to a break. Back then, it was formal and tough training. For example, when I practiced Beng Quan of Xing Yi, I had to keep a low posture on one leg by repeating that movement for at least 10 minutes for each side. When I practiced Pi Quan, I had to maintain the stance for each single movement for at least a couple of minutes. It was very cold in the winter and very hot in the summer in Tianjin. Plus, we had to practice outside since back then there was no gym available for us. I, it was not only a physical training, but more importantly, what I realized later, it was also a mental training. So, I had to sweat in all four seasons and of course, I would sweat a lot more in the summertime. Fortunately, I was very young back then and my family took good care of me and fed me very well. Then, when I was nearing my 30s, I changed the way I practiced. I adapted a more natural approach in that instead of having a fixed schedule like before. I just practiced whenever I want, and my practice became a, a seamless part of my daily life. So, I believe that up to a certain age and with certain experience, you can and should adapt a natural approach instead of a fixed routine. Now, to answer your question, Regarding the intensity, it depends on your objective. Based on my experience, if you are older than 40 years old, overtraining may not be a good idea. I consider overtraining to be any training that makes you feel exhausted the next day. Also, like I have mentioned in my prior video about the training intensity, that you should sweat but not be out of breath, especially when you practice Tai Chi. If you practice Xing Yi, of course, you have to sweat after practice. But again, you should not run out of breath. Of course, cardio training is important in any martial art, but it is not the only path of making progress. So, my suggestion is that you do not have to train so intensively and to run out of breath each time. I think having every 5 minutes of intensive training in martial art will be great for cardio training benefits. Of course, you can increase or decrease the intensity depending on your own physical condition. By the way, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of sweating during winter. 
I consider sweating to be a natural body detox. Unfortunately, the winter in Quebec are very cold. Even so, I still try to sweat two times per day, once through practicing martial art and the other time through drinking tea. I like raw pu'er tea since it makes me sweat a lot easier than other type of tea. Again, it's just my body's reaction to raw pu'er tea. Your mileage may vary. Next question is from Chen Tai Chi Chuan, Nairobi. He left this comment about Tai Chi Chuan's further development. Uh, Mr. Yang, now that Tai Chi Chuan has, be, has been officially recognized by the uh, UNESCO as an intangible cultural heritage for mankind, how would it affect development of uh, traditional styles of Tai Chi in the various communities? Will they be standardized like Karate O Taekwondo? Yes, it's uh, good news, in my opinion. From now on, Tai Chi being added to the UNESCO Intangible Cultural Heritage list is very well deserved and it should have happened a long time ago. But la better later than never. As a Tai Chi practitioner and a teacher, I'm happy about it. But regarding your question, I don't think it will have any major impact on its popularity. And promotion. Especially at a personal level, I don't see much impact brought by this event. But the government in China may potentially take this opportunity to boost nationalism. As for standardization of Tai Chi practice, it already happened decades ago. Fortunately, many traditional practices which promote self expression at higher levels are still alive. At the end of the day, as long as people can choose a style of Tai Chi practice, it will be fine. My only concern is that some organizations may take the opportunity to unify and standardize Tai Chi a step further, which potentially may harm Tai Chi. Please do not forget that Tai Chi is a martial art, it is not a unified dance. Tai Chi can be applied as a way to express the unity of the self with the universe, but not as a unified routine or movement that kills the creative aspect of that practice. Maybe I'm overthinking it. Anyway, let's move on to the next question. An active member of our community, Mr. Thomas Budachesk, who is the Tai Chi teacher from Austria, asked a very interesting question. Thank you, Master Yang, for this clear explanation of the meaning and the origin of straight and the curved. I have a question I hesitated to ask. What's your opinion or understanding of empty force, Ling Kong Jin? It's a good question. I understand your concern. Actually, I did not want to make any comments on this topic, but since you asked this, I will share my opinion with everyone as it might be of interest to many others. First of all, many people may not know that Ling Kong Jin is. Ling Kong Jin can be translated to the empty force. It is a kind of practice that your opponents can be defeated without physical contact. In some communities, especially the Tai Chi community, it is unfortunately an unavoidable phenomenon. Recently, there have been a couple of scandalous incidents in the Tai Chi community in China that some Tai Chi practitioners demonstrated that they could defeat their students with little to no physical contact. Such a demonstration is called Ling Kong Jin. I won't name any names, but you can find many such demonstrations on YouTube. However, 
if you ask me about my opinion of empty force, I would say that it is just hollow showmanship and more dangerously a form of psychological manipulation of your students. Think about it. Why is it that such a technique only works on their own students but never on challengers or strangers? If it's a real technique resulting from training, the effect should be visible on anyone, not just their own students. If it can work only on their own students, they are effectively implying that their students became weaker after training. In my lifetime, I have witnessed quite a few people who claimed to have this kind of technique. Every time, I asked them to test it on me and it never worked. Even today, I'm still open to this kind of, of test if anyone is willing to, to try. So, like I said that, it is just a form of psychological control and the manipulation of students who had some prior experience of being defeated by the teacher using similar movements. When the teacher repeats the same movement without physical contact, the students may react the same way as with physical contact. Again, Tai Chi has great benefits, but it is not magic and should never be treated as such. A member whose name I couldn't read, and I suspect most of you wouldn't be able to read either, asked in the monthly question video, can I ask the question of, can someone learn only a certain part of the internal styles such as only learning the five elements and the Xiang Xing Shu for Xing Yi and the eight main palms for Ba Gua and just Yi Lu for Chen style? My answer is yes, of course. Actually, for someone who just want to learn a bit of martial art and keep improving what they have learned, that is a good choice. However, I prefer to have a systematic approach in terms of learning. It is not necessary to limit ourselves to learning only one art. I believe that as long as you can master a style, learning more than one style is a better approach. Also, I believe that it is a better approach to practice one style in depth instead of uh, dabbling with different styles without focus. My understanding is that it is not how many styles you practice. It is about how deep your practice is. Actually, having a deep understanding of the single style is more practical and interesting compared to practicing many styles without reaching a good level in any. I also recommend my students to focus on one style in the beginning, then move on to another style in the future. Some teachers do not apply the same approach, but that's their choice. Hope that answers your question. Next question is from Mr. Jake Carlins. He asks, Ms. Yang, I have a question. I'm trying to work on the circling in Xing Yi. My understanding is that there are small circle, circles in each element. Is it true? How should I practice this to get better at them? A great question here. It's great to know that you understand the importance of a circular movement in Xing Yi. Yes, there are many small circles in Xing Yi practice and each single movement is supposed to be practiced in a circular move motion. I have to say that all of the internal styles request this approach. There's no internal style without circular motion. So, how to practice this? Well, first, you have to know where those circles are. My answer is very simple. The circle is everywhere in Xing Yi. Everywhere. For example, try to have a multiple circle in the body, 
arm, hand, finger, hip, chest. If you want, please watch my Xing Yi demonstration videos and pay attention to details. You will find a lot of small circle mo movements in each movement. Also, please keep in mind that circular movements do not involve a full circle, it is a spiral motion. In martial art practice, spiral motion is the spirit of the circle. Next question is from Mr. Daniel Luo. He asked a question related to the health benefit of practicing Xing Yi Five Elements. He asked, could you elaborate on how practicing the Five Elements Fist help to strengthen the major organs from the TCM scientific perspective, as described by Master Sun Lu Tang? Well, you are totally right about the Sun Lu Tang's writing. Before Sun Lu Tang, most of the Xing Yi training documents did not mention enough about the health benefit of a Xing Yi practice. Sun Lu Tang was officially the first person who emphasized the health benefit of the style. I think this idea is great because it is the further development of the promotion of martial art training. It indicates that less than a century ago, a few people like Sun Lu Tang already paid attention to the health benefit brought to the community. So, to answer this question, I can only explain it based on the TCM perspective. In TCM, strengthening a certain organ can be achieved through stimulating a certain meridian of that organ. Very often, the meridian will pass through the external body surface that correlates to the organ. In practice, intentionally paying attention in terms of generating a physical movement by that area can strengthen and stimulate the meridian of certain organs. That is the TCM perspective. So, in Xing Yi Five Element Theory, each element is related to a specific organ, including metal is related to lungs, wood is related to liver, fire is related to heart, water is related to kidneys, earth is related to spleen. So, in martial practice, focus on the chest movement is believed to be able to stimulate the lungs meridian and strengthen the lungs and the similar effect for other elements and their respective organs, which is very reasonable. However, only theory alone does not mean much in reality. For example, in Tai Chi practice, there is no specific movement correlated to a specific organ. Does that imply Tai Chi does not have any health benefits? or even if you consider simple running. Nobody has applied the five element concept to it, but running provides great, great health benefit. So, I agree that Xing Yi can have a great deal of health benefit, but it is not that necessary to focus on the relationship between the five elements and the five organs. Sun Lu Tang was a great martial artist. But his idea of promoting the health benefit by talking about the relationship between the five organs to the five types of health benefit is, in my opinion, a bit mechanical. I studied TCM in university in China, so I promote the overall health benefit of practicing Xing Yi or any other styles of martial art that may or may not involve five element theory used in practice. In martial training, the five element theory was originally created for martial application purposes and should be applied as such. Again, five element theory used in TCM is for healing, not for combat as used in martial art. This is my understanding of this topic. Hope that answers your question. 
Next question is from Mr. Qin Long. Sorry, uh, I'm butchering your first name. He asked a question about Xiu Dao. He said, Can you talk more on the dragon and the tiger, uh, lead and the mercury? Please, long time no talk about Xiu Dao. First off, sorry for that. Posting Xiu Dao videos is quite a while as I have been focusing on the Decoding Martial Proverbs series. I will resume posting Xiu Dao videos very soon. But anyway, I'd like to answer your Xiu Dao question here, so I hope that's some uh, uh, consolation. Dragon and Tiger, Light and Mercury are symbolic terms used in Xiu Dao. Different schools provide different explanations of these terms. In addition, the same school will provide different meanings to a, to a term at different stages of development as well. But basically, dragon and mercury are interchangeable, tiger and lead are interchangeable. Also, I explained in my prior shootout video that internal shootout practice started from the external elixir practice. So, a lot of terms used in internal elixir or Xiu Dao originated from external elixir practice. This is why in external elixir, mercury is dragon and lead is tiger, and in internal elixir practice, dragon is a term used to describe primordial Shen or spirit, and the tiger is the primordial qi or energy. Furthermore, since we focus on the Xiu Dao practice, light is a term used to describe the primordial essence and the qi, since light is heavy and easy to sink downward and leak away, while mercury is used to describe the primordial spirit, since Mercury is not stable and can be evaporated easily and get lost easily. Therefore, people use the expression of uh, tame the tiger and capture the dragon to indicate the harmonization of uh, Jing, Qi, and Shen, or essence, energy, and spirit. Next question is from uh, One Direction about Bagua practice. He said, please explain and hopefully demonstrate the difference, difference between single palm and the double palm change in Bagua. I think it is more involved than simple striking with one palm at, and opposite to two palms. Thanks. First of all, the Bagua eight big palms are named based on the body movement, not on hand movement. So, single changing palm actually means the body changed in the direction once. The double changing palm means that the body makes a, the circle twice. It is about the body making circles, and neither about the hands or stepping. Now, let me demonstrate it. Hello, I'd like to demonstrate the Cheng Cell's single changing palm and double changing palm, in order to explain that the reason for these two names is based on the body movement, not the hand and the stepping. Right. So the single changing palm of Cheng Cell is like this. So turn, push, then cross, extend, then walk. So the body turns once, so from here, one, then body turns at this motion, once. But for the double changing palm, the body turns twice. So let me demonstrate for you. So one, two, three, four, then five, then bike, then turn. So now you can see body turns two times, so this is the first time, then second, Time, right? So body turn two times. 
at the double chain pump. I hope this answers your question. Thank you. Mr. Ovidu Samplin, sorry if I'm butchering your name, asked an interesting question. You seem like a very active and knowledgeable teacher, so I would like to ask you a question. Since all the three styles have their own strong point, would it be fine to start with learning the Xingyi striking and stance but not the stepping? Follow up with Tai Chi and then only learn the stepping application of Bagua. Well, I believe I know quite a lot, but there are also many things that I still do not know. So I think the objective knowledgeable would be highly subjective here. But anyway, thank you for your compliment. They certainly made my day. So let me return the favor by answering your question. Yes, each of the three styles has its own strong point, but its, its strong point of benefit is based on its systematic practice. You cannot practice striking of Xing Yi and expect the striking to be very powerful without its body movement and stepping. You cannot practice Bagua stepping and walking well without the right body and hand movement. Even if you consider an already existing hybrid style like Xing Yi Bagua Palm, you would first need to learn Xing Yi and Bagua individually before you can get any good at Xing Yi Bagua Palm. Again, the benefit is from the entire system, not a part of it. Next question is from Mr. David Johnston. He actually asked two questions and I would like to answer both for him. He said, one question I have is the meaning and the timing of Yi Qi Li. I was taught that Yi is mind, Qi is breath, and Li is body. In striking or execution of the technique, it starts with intention, then the breath ends its exhalation a slight second before the execution of the strike leading to the transfer of energy into the opponent's being struck. Is this correct? Second question would be, what is the proper way to address you in this video comments if one is not a formal stu student of yours? Uh, Mr. Johnston, you asked me two questions and let me answer one by one. To the first one, it is particularly right based on my understanding. However, the definition of qi is not that clear here. So I created a proverb, yi yi zhu li, which translated to use the mind to amplify the power. Another explanation can be uh, to use the yi to apply the intention, use the li or power to execute the strike. Qi would include other factors such as timing, breathing, and even experience. So I think it becomes clearer this way. As for the breathing, it should follow the movement or coordinate with your movement. Breathing alone does not generate folly or force. For your second question, you should always address me as Supreme Ultimate Grandmaster Yang. Of course, I'm kidding. I'm aware that many martial art teachers may demand you address them a certain way. That's not the case with me. I'm very open to anything that you want to use to call me. As long as it is polite, that's fine. I'm a polite person to, to others. And I have been very lucky to meet a lot of polite people, both in real life and online. Hope that answers your question and thank you. Let's go to the next question. Again, Mr. Thomas Hodachesk asked me another great question. He said, I would also like to ask another rather personal question. 
What kind of exercise do you practice regularly to train your basic skills? Do you have a personal training routine you are doing daily, or a routine of basic skill training you would recommend it to us? Good question. I think I have answered it partially in the prior part of this video. Basically, I have not had a fixed routine for more than 20 years. Alrighty. And I just practice whatever comes to my mind. But each summer, I correct my Tai Chi from the first movement to the last in order to make sure my practice is correct. Every day, I practice some Fajin exercise and randomly chose some movements to practice. Before, I would randomly practice movement while talking with people, but it may come across as rude. So I try my best to avoid it during conversations. Okay, I have answered many questions today. I hope my answers were clear enough. Thank you for watching. See you next time and enjoy your practice.